today on Ag Etc. We're at High Plain Journal's Soil U, where Jamie Lynn Farney talks about how incorporating cattle into your cropping system encourages sustainable production. Frank Godekin talks about a good backgrounding ration versus a not so good backgrounding ration at Cattle U. We wrap up the Rossfield Field Day with Stu Duncan, who updates us on how their research fields responded to weed management this year. Then Kent Martin was a panel member at Wheaton Sorghum U and shares important topics and issues with emerging technologies in the industry that were addressed. Wheat Blast, learn what it is and what scientists are doing to combat this devastating wheat fungus in other countries to keep it from coming to the U.S. It's all coming up right now on Ag Etc. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about employee safety and work comp coverage. On your farm, do you ask your friends to come help? Are they considered employees or neighbors helping neighbors? Did you know that you can be held responsible just as if it's a work comp accident? Give me a call, we can discuss. 316-945-6733. Join us for the 15th annual Fall Bull Sale at Gardner Angus Ranch, Monday, September 30th at 9 a.m., featuring approximately 450 registered bulls, 160 registered females, including 35 cows and 125 heifers, and 300 bred commercial females. These are elite herd sire prospects and rank in the top percentiles of the Angus breed for calving ease, growth, and end product merit. Catalog will be available at GardnerAngus.com. Register for online bidding at LiveAuction.tv. It's business as usual producing value-added seed stock that provides opportunities for profitability regardless of our customer's chosen marketing endpoint. See you in September at the ranch. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center. Your stem cells, your health, your life. So being a, a beef specialist, my talk was really focused on integration of cattle within cropping systems and their benefit. As I summarized in my start of my talk, integration of cattle within cropping systems is a way to encourage sustainable production with economic and environmental benefits, all of which is our goals as agricultural producers. When we're specifically thinking about cover crops for cattle, we need to think about plant species selection what grows, what doesn't, what cattle prefer, what is some of their palatable ones, what are some potential toxicities and issues, are some other management practices you need to think about before implementing an annual forage or a cover crop into your system. So some of the issues in association with uh, integration of cattle within cropping systems. Uh, we just completed a study with K-State Extension Group that found that the number one reason people don't put cattle in cropping systems is lack of fences followed by water. So those are two big issues you have to worry about. And when you talk to most people, they still think compaction is an issue with cattle. Most of the research shows that you might see compaction in the top 2.54 centimeters or an inch. Luckily in Kansas, we have freeze thaw cycles and a very diverse weather environment that breaks up that soil in the top inch. So it's not as big of an issue. Now from the annual forage and a cattle side, um, I have a, actually a publication that addresses it, potentially toxic annual forages. Most of these annual forages have a metabolic issue or could be a metabolic issue for cattle, including some that are just flat out poisonous. One of them um, that's a wonderful cover crop but concerns me from a grazing perspective is hairy vetch. Um, it's actually listed on the USDA's poisonous plant registry and we don't really know what causes the issue. Certain cattle just appear to be allergic or susceptible to hairy vetch toxicity. And if they show signs, it's 50 to 100% lethal. So it can be an issue in your operation. So managing for toxicities, being able to contain your animals, and providing a water source are things to think about with integration of cattle and cropping systems. The beauty the joy and also the most frustrating thing about using annual forages within cropping systems and with cattle is you have so many goals and objectives. And so you really have to sit and think about 
what is my purpose? Um, do I want to maximize cattle gains? Do I want to find something that fits in with my rotation? What are some potential detriments to each of those systems? So one thing, um, we're always wanting to try and find something to follow soybeans in our rotation because most of the time that's when our fallow occurs. And sometimes in the southeast area, we might not have our soybeans come off till the first of December. There's really nothing you can plant December 1st that's really gonna have much of a growth um, until maybe March. So when we've looked at trying to interseed some cover crops into our soybeans, some selection mistakes we've had are plants that grew taller than our beans. So we weren't able to harvest beans. So that's something you have to think about. Um, you also have to think about, do you wanna plant something that cattle are gonna completely consume or something they're gonna shy away from to leave some available biomass out in your field? So you really have to come up with your operational goals from a cropping side, from a cattle side, and from a cash flow economic perspective. What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value, that future is here, the time is now. To meet end user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. You don't have to be a farmer or rancher to become a Kansas Farm Bureau member. Anyone can join. As a member, you'll get discounts on things like hotels and entertainment, health and wellness services, cell phone plans, and more. You'll also strengthen the lives of your fellow Kansans and help build strong, prosperous communities through agriculture advocacy and education. Join us today. Visit kfb.org slash join to learn more. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. This segment brought to you by Santa Fe Trail Meats in Overbrook. Let us help feed your family. Hi, I'm Frank Godekin. Uh, just got done talking about backgrounding rations and what makes a good backgrounding ration versus a not so good backgrounding ration. You know, in feed yards all the time we talk, talk to managers that are frustrated that cattle come in, some are no problems, perform well, and the same cattle from a different, different backgrounder will have maybe up to 10% death loss, don't perform as well and uh, definitely don't have as nice carcasses. So what are the key points to look at? Um, one, we've got to realize that we're taking young animals and developing the rumen and making those into ruminants, not necessarily just bringing them in, locking them up and feeding them. One of the other key points is not to have stress. You know, think about it if you will, running cattle through a chute with a hot shot is stressful. That may affect the effectiveness of the vaccine. Giving the cattle a better environment, a bedded pen, plenty of access to water or feed, all those things reduce stress because they miss mama, their digestive tract's not set up to handle this feed, and every bug known to man is gonna attack them. So we have some issues to start with. You know, as we develop the rumen, we have to think about what diet we feed. And we try to feed a diet that's roughly 35 to 50 percent roughage. Energy levels, oh, around 50 to 54 NEG. This allows the animal to eat and not have a diet that's really high in roughage that he can't digest properly because his digestive tract's not developed yet. And in doing so, getting good nutrition into the animal, it allows the, him to recover from the stress of weaning, the stress of transport, and also may recover from nutrients that they're deficient in. 
So getting them to eat a balanced diet is very critical. Part of that is mineral nutrition. And some K-State data that we reviewed, over 60% of the forage samples from 18 states was deficient in zinc. So we need to make sure the zinc levels are adequate. Copper is another very important trace mineral. So with all that in mind, we can't get that all done with just wet distillers and hay. It doesn't work. You know, some of the real good feedstuffs that we have are the silage products, especially corn silage, and feeding those in a well-blended, mixed diet with the right nutrients gets us the best opportunity for those cattle to grow, do well, and not get sick. My name is Karen Cope and I have multiple sclerosis. When you have MS, on the outside you look great, but you know what's really going on in the inside is chronic body pain, chronic fatigue. And there's lots of days that I'd wake up and say, well, please God, help me get through this day. You know, after stem cells, Chloe, my youngest daughter, she was asked by my father-in-law, how's your mom doing? And Chloe said, uh, Grandpa, I've never had a mom like this before because she was eight when I was diagnosed and she really had no other memory of me but being sick. It's really the simple things that we do as a family, like play cards and, and to be able to win at cards, you know, they all laugh because I used to repeat myself and say, what hand are we on? You know, what's, where are we at? And it's just been really a, a true blessing from God and we're, we're really thankful. What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value, that future is here, the time is now. To meet end user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Okay, looks like it's time for our tour. Welcome to the Fort Wallace Museum. Here at the museum, you're gonna find some really interesting stuff like our replica stagecoach from the Butterfield Overland Dispatch. We've got facades from the fort buildings. We've got an 1870s flag. There's a plesiosaur that was discovered locally. We've got the Ray pump organ collection. We're a little bit place with a great big story and we'd love to have you. Welcome to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center, right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas, located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. This segment brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. I'm Stu Duncan, uh, Northeast Region Extension Specialist, Crops and Soils for Kansas State University based out of Manhattan, Kansas. This year, what we've seen out here is similar to last year with a good pre-emergent program, you can hold back those Palmer amaranth and water hemp depending on which uh, and, and other spring seeded species, and at least in soybeans. The big thing we're seeing too is that the, the interaction between row spacing, the narrower row spacing gives us a much quicker canopy, which will also allow us to uh, potentially use one less post-emerge application of uh, herbicide for the, uh, the secondary weed control. Um, the weeds are, well, are generally a little heavier in the 30 inch rows and the wide rows. Uh, we've had pretty good good control with our early weed control. We did plant later in early June this year, so we didn't have quite the massive of top growth that we had in the 
in the weeds as we did last year. Different site too, so maybe not as many palmer, but we had a, a pretty good control with them. We do need to hit them early if you're gonna kill them. We do need a grass control in there, at least from our results last year. Um, in addition, when we're using our post-emerge program, but we've had uh, really good, good weed control potentially really good yields and of course uh, if we even under if we weren't under irrigation we've had a lot of rain if we got our beans in this year uh, we had good activation of our pre-emerge and we've had pr uh, pretty good control with our post-emerge and mopping things up farmers have done a really good job this year of getting their post-emerge herbicides out things were tough to get timely but we've done a really good job of cleaning up a lot of these fields that uh, but, it, but this really shows the importance of having a good pre-emerge program You don't have to be a farmer or rancher to become a Kansas Farm Bureau member. Anyone can join. As a member, you'll get discounts on things like hotels and entertainment, health and wellness services, cell phone plans, and more. You'll also strengthen the lives of your fellow Kansans and help build strong, prosperous communities through agriculture advocacy and education. Join us today. Visit kfb.org join to learn more. Join us for the 15th annual Fall Bull Sale at Gardner Angus Ranch, Monday, September 30th at 9 a.m. Featuring approximately 450 registered bulls, 160 registered females, including 35 cows and 125 heifers, and 300 bred commercial females. These are elite herd sire prospects and rank in the top percentiles of the Angus breed for calving ease, growth, and end product merit. Catalog will be available at GardnerAngus.com. Register for online bidding at LiveAuction.tv. It's business as usual producing value-added seed stock that provides opportunities for profitability regardless of our customer's chosen marketing endpoint. See you in September at the ranch. Hello, I'm Dr. Frank Lyons from Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center here in Manhattan, Kansas. Daryl was one of our patients that we did about seven months ago. I dug trees by hand for years and years and years. In the process, I wore out my rotary cuff. But when I learned about this process, I thought if there's a way to get rid of this pain, then I then I want to do it. So we did it and it worked. I'm not going to go out and take trees with a shovel anymore, but, but I can do the things that I want to do now. Well, it's been very gratifying to help people with their painful joints and other uh, entities and it's been especially gratifying to be able to help people who I know and have worked with and known for many years. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Well, my name's Kent Martin from Northwest Oklahoma, close to Alva, and was invited to be a part of the grower panel. And I, I really think it's interesting to be a part of a grower panel to, to share our thoughts and ideas. I also think it's really interesting and, and uh, unique to have that grower panel at the beginning. For me, I notice a lot of times it seems like the greatest value is when the audience is engaged. And it seems like the grower panel is a great way to start off the day in that way, to be able to get people engaged, to get them interested in your topic. And I think at the end of the day, the question is, do, does the audience go home with what they wanted and needed out of the program? And when they're engaged, I think it helps to make that happen. There were several that had some, some good questions, some discussion about biological impacts and interactions with emerging technologies was one that uh, actually became a big part of a topic that transitioned into my later talks. So that was one that obviously was on people's minds that they wanted to think about and talk about. I think other interesting technologies in terms of grain handling and things that we see in the future that everyone has their own idea of what will be important for their operation. And I think looking at that variety of topics that we talked about gets everyone stimulated and, 
and thinking about different things that might be important for their operation as well. So often there is one missing link in the system. So we see these kind of programs organized in this way because it brings together everyone from those that have the theoretical knowledge and the scientific knowledge to those in the intermediate parts that implement the technology or, or send that technology out to farmers and then the farmers who actually use it. When we have all of these different people together in the same room, we can have those discussions and those questions and really connect the two together. I discussed a lot of different options for cropping systems and crop rotations and how those decisions might be made on what you grow and what you might put into a primary rotation, what you might put into a rotation as an alternative crop or an opportunity crop. We talked a lot about uh, different things that might need to be managed differently as you look at these different crops and considerations you might need to take. I think at the end the big points were, number one, to plan out your crop rotation appropriately and make sure that you're planned to be successful in the crop rotation. And number two, when we look at crop rotations and crops in general, focus on income and value coming out of that rotation as a whole and not just the individual crops because we see opportunities within a rotation that add a lot of value and that value shouldn't just be dismissed in terms of income for a crop. Yeah, the rotation decisions I think come about from a variety of ways and I think that's all dependent on someone's knowledge level and experience level. And I think the important thing is to recognize the resources that are available and some of those may be as simple as getting a herbicide guidebook. K-State puts out a great one that is very informative in terms of what you can do from a herbicide standpoint in crop rotations, right down to talking to those individuals at, at the universities who develop publications like that, or your agronomist who walks the fields who sees more different crop rotations or herbicides that are used. Some of us will use our local cooperative professionals, and others will use neighbors and friends and parents, and I think that's a very valuable part that I see a lot in my area is neighbors calling neighbors and asking what worked and what didn't and realizing that we have different challenges with different environmental conditions and how the experience of one person even in that individual year can assist a neighbor with their decisions. So all of those and it goes beyond that. There's so many people that can be used as resources and then of course online resources as well. Kansas Corn reminds you that E15 fuel is the right choice for every kind of driver. For the car enthusiast, E15 has higher octane. For the thrifty driver, E15 is priced lower than regular unleaded. For the nature lover, E15 provides cleaner air. For the shopper who buys local, E15 has more ethanol from our Kansas corn farms. Choose E15 for a higher octane, lower price, cleaner American fuel. Message from the Kansas Corn Commission. Learn more at kscorn.com. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need, and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yeah, we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'll be glad to answer and work with you. Imagine turning soybean oil, used cooking oils, and waste animal fats into fuel so amazing it drives U.S. jobs and our economy forward. Learn more about biodiesel at americasadvancedbiofuel.com. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet, 
This segment brought to you by SureCrop, liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We worry about this disease because it's hard to control. So in regions where it's established, farmers stop growing wheat because there's nothing they can do. When the weather is right, they're going to lose 100% of their crop. Wheat blast is a disease that emerged in Brazil in 1985. The fungus has jumped to the wheat crop and, and it's a very serious disease. It's very hard to control. This fungus is really good at overcoming the resistance we try to use. So we've been using genomics to try to understand the mechanisms of variability in this fungus. We discovered that the fungus has extra small chromosomes in addition to its seven regular chromosomes. So these small chromosomes are highly variable and they're present in some strains but not in other strains. So we have identified a useful resistance which can be incorporated in the, the varieties that are in the area at risk. We've done uh, forecasting to identify the areas, the area at risk for this disease. Uh, we've done work with fungicides. And so um, we, we're just putting together a management plan to um, control this disease. We need to keep that disease out of U.S. wheat. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Earlier in my life, I rode bucking horses and rodeos, and my shoulders took such a beating, and that was probably the reason for having several previous surgeries on both shoulders. About a year ago, I decided that I didn't want to have another surgery, and so I contacted Kansas Regenerative Medicine, took their treatment process. It was relatively pain-free. Now, after eight months, my shoulders have healed to the point where I think I'm probably 90 to 95 percent of normal. It takes a couple of months to start to see results and feel real progress. That continued to increase gradually until now at approximately eight months. And I'm extremely pleased. I've got full range of motion. I can lift weights. I can throw. I can do uh, a lot of things that uh, I couldn't do without a lot of pain previously. So I'm, I'm tickled to death with the results and I'd recommend this process to anyone. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about umbrella coverage. Did you know that if you're held liable in any type of accident, the judgment can claim your assets? Please give me a call so we can discuss 316-945-6733.